And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. Well, it's been one month since uh, the assassination attempt on Donald Trump's life there in Butler, Pennsylvania, and so many questions remain. Uh, although Trump has been quite forthcoming and outspoken about what he went through, uh, his experience. Uh, he did that, of course, uh, on the final night of the RNC in Milwaukee. Uh, he did that last night speaking with Elon Musk uh, on X. We have a clip of it. Let's watch. Immediately that it was a bullet. I knew immediately that it was at the ear. Yeah. And because uh, it, you know, it hit very hard, but hit the ear. And I also heard people shout, bullets, bullets, uh, you know, get down, get down, because I, you know, I moved down pretty nicely, pretty quickly, and we had bullets flying right over my head after I went down, so I'm glad I went down. The, the bigger miracle was that I was looking in the exact direction of the shooter, and so it hit, it hit me at an angle that was uh, far less destructive than any other angle, so that was the miracle. That was, yeah. for those people that don't believe in God, I think yeah, yeah, we got to all start thinking about that you have to uh you know i'm i'm a believer now i'm more of a believer i think and a lot of people have said that to me a lot of great people have said that to me actually okay so uh that clip uh sets up some of our conversations we're going to have right now uh, about all of this uh but uh some news today uh trump indicated in that very interview that he'll hold a rally in butler pennsylvania sometime in october uh that he'll go back to the site uh and the house Trump assassination attempt task force chairman, Mike Kelly, the congressman from Pennsylvania, Butler's in his district. He tells Fox News Digital today that the task force is planning an official trip to Butler to visit the rally shooting site at the end of this month, the week of August the 26th. He said attendance is confirmed for nearly all 13 lawmakers. Remember, this is a bipartisan task force set up by both House Speaker Mike Johnson and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries to get to the bottom of what happened. It will be their first time meeting all together in person since Speaker Johnson and Leader Jeffries put the task force together. Uh, also, uh, in the meantime, like I said, we do want to devote a large chunk uh, of this hour diving into the questions that remain about how something like this could have happened. We're going to do that with our friends, National Security Analyst Hal Kempfer uh, and uh, Bill Gage with the Safe Haven Security Group, a former member of the Secret Service himself. Uh, gentlemen, Thanks for joining us here uh, on Live Now tonight. Uh, Hal, I want to start with you. Uh, you and I have talked about this uh, extensively here. One of the outstanding questions that remains uh, is why 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks did this. Uh, he has a very low digital profile. Uh, some would say he has a very low social profile in person, uh, or did rather. Um, why don't we know the motive yet? And will we ever? Uh, Andrew, what we don't have is a, a clear motive as far as uh, some ideology, some violent extremist belief system that's just not very clear. Psychologically, I think what's coming out is that he fits a certain profile. I will leave that to Bill to explain that more. But he, he fits a certain profile we've seen with uh, assassins in the past. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is he has an extremely high IQ, uh, but he has what, what many would say was an extremely low EQ, if you will, emotional uh, intelligence from what, what we can tell. And uh, he'd been bullied uh, throughout his youth. So he does fit a certain profile, but but as of now, we don't know. Now, there still is some outstanding communications online that were uh, encrypted, and maybe that will shed more light. But uh, but we really, you know, it's uh, other than the fact that he wanted fame, and, and at one point he was looking at multiple, uh, you know, multiple, politicians yeah. that wasn't just settled on Trump. Uh, we'll find out more. So, you know, Bill, authorities cracked into his phone. The FBI got into his phone. They scoured his computer. They scoured his home and car. They interviewed more than 100 people. Uh, there's been no public disclosure that the shooter left any writings or manifesto or, or suicide note. He barely had a social media profile. Uh, a law enforcement official briefed on the investigation told the Associated Press uh, that his phone had not immediately yielded any meaningful clues related to motive or whether he acted alone or with others. How much more difficult does that make the job of the FBI, the Secret Service, so many of these investigators who are trying to determine why Crooks did this? 
Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. You, uh, you know, I think the two questions are, you know, how did this happen and why did it happen? And, you know, how did it happen, I think, is going to come out in the investigation. It sounds like there's going to be multiple investigations now. Obviously, the FBI is doing an investigation. The Secret Service will, will do their own sort of internal investigation. Uh, it sounds like Congress is going to do another investigation, going to have sort of a 9-11 style commission to investigate, you know, um, how did this happen? As far as why it happened, you know, what his motives were, you know, it's very likely that we may never know. Uh, they may never get into his phone. Um, it, it sounds like he was a loner with minimal social contact, minimal social networks, both uh, sort of uh, digital social networks and sort of a, you know, a, a real social network. It sounded like minimal friends. Uh, he was very reclusive. So we, we may never, ever know what his true motives were. So, you know, one of the things we know from these kind of attacks is people just don't snap. He, he didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to go try to assassinate former President Trump. You know, it's very clear with some of the open source reporting that's come out. Um, he did a lot of planning into this, both from the purchase of a, uh, he, made, he made a large purchase of uh, ammunition. Uh, he was practicing at, at a local gun range. He, he borrowed the rifle. He went to Home Depot and bought a ladder. So this was something that he had been planning for days and weeks. He clearly knew he needed to access a building in order to carry out his attack. So, you know, I, I, I just think that we may never know why he did this. You know, uh, Hal, we know in the wake of the JFK assassination, uh, a whole universe of conspiracy theories uh, arose in the wake of that. Um, we've seen a, a little bit of that in the wake of the Trump assassination attempt, although uh, the very difference is Trump survived. And so maybe that's why we're not seeing this huge universe of that just yet. But, but back to Crooks's background, what do we know about whether he was known to law enforcement or, or about his mental health or, or medical history at all? Do we have details on those pieces of information or not just yet? Because those would help, would they not? It would help a lot. Uh, you know, as you know, I've spent a lot of time, a big chunk of my life is in what you basically call threat assessment. Uh, whether it's looking at active shooters, potential assassins, uh, you know, spies, and of course, foreign countries, terrorist groups, things like that. And you look for those indicators. You look for those things that tell you that someone is a, a, a taking on violent extremist beliefs, or is intent on violence. Uh, and of course, if there was a psychologist here, we'd probably talk about some of the psychological indicators that you look for that are indicators that they're going to do some sort of mass violent event or something like that. And, you know, he has some of those, some of those have come across that he certainly, you know, he'd been bullied in school. Um, you know, he has a lot of those introverted things that we've seen with uh, would-be assassins in the past or assassins. Uh, on the other hand, there, there is none of those uh, other classic indications. In fact, most of the stuff that comes out uh, is really what I call more tactical or operational. You know, the stuff that goes into doing the actual attack, you know, uh, and that's the things that have been kind of surfaced over time. Uh, it's those uh, pre indicators, if you will, you know, flying the, uh, the drone just, a, you know, a, a couple hours before, a few hours before the uh the event uh obviously he was side is acting suspiciously although as uh, i'm sure bill and many others will tell you at these types of events uh if we don't see suspicious individuals we're just not looking hard enough there's always somebody in an event this big that looks suspicious that's why there's security there we spot them and we track them all the time that's how we hope to intercept and stop anything from happening uh but he got too far the question is what was his motivation? And, and, and I guess the, um, the thing that we may never know with the encrypted communications, was he talking to somebody else? You know, a lot of times these lone wolves, as they're called, uh, they actually will, will fall into an online community and they will talk to like-minded individuals who may be very geographically separate uh, around the country or around the world and they may be getting pumped up or, 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 or basically getting instructions on how to do things from them. That's what I kind of like to know. We're just not there yet. And okay. I don't know if we're, you know, as Bill mentioned, you know, the phone is tough. The yeah. encrypted comms are tough. So um, this kind of leads logically into the next question about the shooter's motive. Why wasn't the shooter stopped? Uh, and so we can 
kind of tease out some of those questions that, that still remain. We have some of these, these maps of the site in Butler. I want to put them up here uh, of where all of this happened. You see where the Secret Service sniper teams, the counter sniper teams were located, uh, where the gunman was, uh, and where, of course, the victims were located in the rally and where Trump was in the rally on the rally stage. Um, Bill, my question to you is this about why the shooter wasn't stopped um, and the seemingly pretty big breakdown between local and state law enforcement and the Secret Service in their communications here because uh, local counter sniper teams were made aware of a suspicious person uh, well before the rally even started uh, and the shooter was not neutralized of course uh, until the Secret Service first saw them that that was the moment that the Secret Service took out the shooter was when the shooter already had fired off the rounds, of course. And so isn't that an indication uh, of some type of institutional failure that some of the local law enforcement on the ground were made aware of the threat? Or maybe not the threat, but that there was a suspicious individual in one Thomas Matthew Crooks, um, but that didn't get up to the higher echelons of the Secret Service who are there on the ground, Bill? Great question. A lot to unpack there. So, yeah. so listen, Hal is exactly right. You know, I worked probably thousands of events when I was an agent, uh, both as a junior agent and on the counter-assault team. And at every single event I ever worked, someone was reported or multiple people were reported as, as being suspicious and unusual interest. Somebody shows up to the magnetometers, you know, with a letter for the president. Someone's there to say, hey, I'm, I'm here to marry the president. Um, every single event I worked at, there were people like that at the event. And it's a Secret Service's job to come out and assess. They have a very robust, what's called protective intelligence. It came out of the Kennedy assassination. And the Warren Commission is one of the big faults that they found that the Secret Service was not out there doing what's called protective intelligence. So uh, the, the, the service has a very robust protective intelligence, and they will actually come out and, and interview these people. So, you know, Every single event I worked that happened. And, uh, you know, in this case, you know, a lot to unpack with your question there, Andrew. And so, you know, in this case, um, you know, the question is, why wasn't he stopped? Well, the first thing is, right, if the Secret Service had their way, they would put the president in this sort of Elon Musk designed bomb proof shelter. They would bring him out once a year, he'd wave to a few people, and they'd put him back into this shelter for 364 days. The fact of the matter is we live in a free democracy, okay? We're not uh, China, we're not a surveillance state, and, you know, pe people have rights. And so, you know, the service has to balance that where, you know, it's not like you see on TV that everybody that comes to these events has had a DNA scan or, you know, a retinal scan. The Secret Service has a full background on every single person attending the event. So it's just not like that. A lot of these events have thousands and thousands of people and the service has to has to screen them and do their best within the confines of the law and technology uh, to ensure they're not bringing in weapons to the event and um, that they try to set up a, a secure environment with multiple layers of security. So if one layer of security is defeated, there'll be an overlapping another uh, layer of security that will will pick that up. So um, in this case, you know, he was seen before the event. Um, there's suspicious people at all of these events. Okay. So I, I think that plays a role. But let me just touch on the comms piece, Andrew, because, sure. you know, how can definitely speak to this? Um, I, I heard an old Marine tell me one time, like the, the first rule of combat is comms stink, right? So, um, and listen, it's not like you see on TV, all right? The comms piece and uh, acting director Rowe talked about this. We testified on the Hill. The comms piece is very difficult for the service to solve because it's not a plug and play technology like you would see in a movie, all right? You have all of these different agencies, some with even different brands of radios, okay. all on different frequencies. And you can't just have a, a single radio that will communicate with all of these different agencies. And so, it, you know, we went through that when there were times when I was on the counter assault team, I was carrying four different radios and I would have to put like a little sticky note on each one so I knew which one to talk to if oh, something wow. happened. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very complex problem that the service is, is gonna have to solve. I think this was very eye-opening for them. You know, uh, this country put a man on the moon with some duct tape and aluminum foil, right? Um, 
You know, every piece of information ever created in the history of mankind is on an iPhone. You can find that within seconds. So there has to be a way to solve this comms puzzle, and I think they okay. will they'll get there. But it uh, it's just not as simple as people think. So, of course, we know the director of the Secret Service resigned in the wake of this. Kim Cheadle, the acting director, his name, Ronald Rowe, he held a briefing uh, on August 2nd, last Friday. He said this, that in the last 30 seconds, there was radio chatter that may have happened, indicating there was some type of suspicious person. He said it did not make it over to us, meaning the Secret Service uh, on the ground. He said we did not have a drone on site. He said we didn't put one up. He says there was a request from a local to fly a drone that day. He says we're putting those assets out. He said we should have had better line of sight. He says we were going to leverage technology and put those UAVs up in the future. He said everybody should be using the radio network. We should be able to have direct communications with the people supporting us. Uh, and so, Hal, you talk about the communications barriers at play there on site in Butler. You know, I think to viewers who are watching the American people, this is the Secret Service. Uh, their main job, the one goal, the only goal of their agency is to protect their protectees. Uh, and of course, Donald Trump survived this attempt, uh, but he was shot. And so you could argue and characterize that as a massive failure of the agency, uh, seen not since uh, 1981 with the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan's life. So. Uh, when you talk about communications here, did they not have enough time before the rally took place to get this under control? I I'm trying to get a sense of, was there a reluctance on the ground there that day to communicate amongst each other, or is that just the fact of how everything played out? It, you know, Andrew, uh, communications is not the, the sexiest part of everything that's done out there, all right? Uh, but it is absolutely essential. I mean, it gets down to command, control, communications, uh, intelligence, and and literally I've done uh, numerous tactical operations. I've done them in the military. I've, I've worked it on homeland security type of stuff. And sometimes you literally have to have the radio sitting there, as Bill alluded to. You have to have them in, like in one ear. And I have done that literally. Well, I have two different radios in each ear. And, uh, and I'm kind of air gapping, this being the air gap, and I'm sure there's some would say there's a lot of air between these ears, but anyway, uh, but I'm air gapping and I'm listening to both. This is something, you know, this is a workaround. You know, the, the reality is it goes back to 9-11. We had the same problem, uh, was talking about everybody was on different frequencies. And there's been a number of big initiatives to try and work this issue. I don't know if anybody's ever really solved it. It's a big challenge to try and get this. And, and of course, a lot of times you get the, even if they work out the technology, the comms piece in terms of technology, it's the information transfer. You know, it's not just the fact you have comms, it's what do you do when you get that? How fast do you move that information? How quickly does that become action or counteraction to uh, stop a, a threat like this? And that's where the breakdown is. Okay. Um... Literally, there was indications there on, uh, you know, that they could they could have done some things, they just weren't communicating and they weren't taking actions quite fast enough. Yeah, I want to just go uh, this very brief timeline about some of those communications between the local teams on the ground and with the Secret Service. At 545, a local Butler County Emergency Services Unit counter sniper team member texted the Secret Service counter sniper team leader about a suspicious person and sent two photos of the individual. Uh, at 5.53 p.m., the Secret Service counter sniper team leader texted the Secret Service counter sniper teams that local law enforcement was looking for a suspicious individual outside of the perimeter, quote unquote, lurking around the AGR building. At this time, Secret Service personnel were operating with the knowledge that local law enforcement was working on an issue of a suspicious individual. I've gotten this question a lot, Bill. At that point in time, is that enough? to stop Donald Trump from coming on the stage or not? Uh, what is the Secret Service's protocols if they were aware of a suspicious individual being looked at or, or being monitored? Um, does that preclude the protectee from getting on the stage, from carrying out the event? Do they cancel it? Clearly they didn't, but what's the protocol at the Secret Service level? So no no, no set protocol, Andrew. Okay. You know, every situation is, is uh, different. All right, and that's going to be a judgment call of, of the detail leader in consultation with the staff. A lot, a lot of these decision are, uh, decisions are staff-driven, so uh, there, there's no 
uh, formula, right, that the Secret Service is going to uh, plug in different equations to say, okay, well, we have this suspicious person lurking around, you know, we're going to condition whatever, and uh, we're not going to let the protectee take the stage. So that's a judgment call. And when you combine that with, it is so frequent um, that the Secret Service is dealing with these kind of kinds of incidents, it's so frequent, it's usually not something that's going to prohibit the protectee from taking the stage. If there's no exigent circumstances happening here, right? Okay, we see somebody with a gun in the crowd. Uh, someone tried to, you know, rush the magnetometers. Um, so something like that is not going to prohibit generally. Uh, it's not something that the detail leader is going to say, hey, we're going to hold for a minute. Uh, we're we're going to hold. Uh, the Secret Service calls it a hold. It usually is a room, but for an outdoor rally, it's generally going to be in a, in a covered motorcade. But they'll just hold the protectee in the um, in the limousine or okay. the suburban, whatever it happens to be. So, just because there was local law enforcement was was, was trying to track down the suspicious individual, uh, it, in my time in the Secret Service, that wasn't something that the detail leader was going to say. Okay, we're going to hold until we resolve this situation because, you know, I've, I've told other outlets, Andrew, um, that I've been on, you know, you know. It's the president of the United States. In this case, it's the former president, the, a major political candidate. And, you know, you have to think uh, how embarrassing that would be for the, the protectee, you know, beca because there's suspicious people at all these events. I see. You know, think about it at the presidential, we're, we're, we're the United States of America. So if you think about that, if every single event the president goes to, he's having to wait until the police resolve this suspicious person or the Secret Service respond out and, and deal with, you know, somebody that has a letter for the president, it's just it, the president wouldn't get anything done. And in this case, okay. you know, uh, former President Trump wouldn't be able to, um, be, you know, go out and, and speak at these rallies because these things are happening all the time. Yeah. Another question is uh, about the building itself from where the shooter um, tried to assassinate Donald Trump. Should that security perimeter have extended to include beyond that building. Uh, we do know that there was local counter sniper teams on the second floor inside the building. Uh, and so, you know, back to this communications resources question, you know, was the Secret Service too reliant on local police or were local police expecting more than enough from the Secret Service here? How, help us suss out some of those questions. Well, uh, and Bill would, would, you know, first off, he would explain this very well. It's it's not so much the perimeter, it's is everything covered. You know, there is those different layers of security that are in it. Uh, the building obviously uh, was under local law enforcement coordination. Now that's gonna get into the planning of what was done out there, who should have been out there, how that should have been under observation. Um, there may be something that comes out in the, in the investigation that shows that there was somebody there who moved. I've already seen some things that indicate that some people may have been out of position. And, and that may have been part of what was going on, but that's part of that whole thing. It's not necessarily expanding the perimeter that's covered by Secret Service. There is a limitation of Secret Service resources. Even, even with the Secret Service personnel, you'll often find that uh, there'll be those who are part of the larger Secret Service detail that are actually not Secret Service. They're actually from other agencies. They're uh, 1811 special agents that may have been pulled in from Homeland Security investigations or some other agency, they get a, they get a, not the same degree of training. They get some training. They get some certainly some direction on what they're supposed to do, but they will push that perimeter out with their coverage. But in all these things, you have to have local law enforcement because they're such big events. There would there really is no way short of coming in with a small army that uh, that you could actually cover this with organic yeah. resources. You have to use the locals and you have to use them effectively. That's the big question. Okay. What were they told? What was the plan? And were people out of position? And we've already identified the comms problem. So we already know there were some real operational problems, shortfalls, if you will, that led to the shooting. Yeah. Um, do, do, uh, Andrew, Bill, can I, go ahead. do we have time for me to touch on that? Yeah, of course. To further up, down. Listen, how, how's exactly right there, okay? The, the Secret Service has a finite amount of resources. Right in a perfect world, they would have been able to send a thousand agents to that site with 50 counter sniper teams, but that's just not the reality. And the reality is that Biden had a, an event the next day uh, at the LGB, uh, LGBJ library, uh, the Lyndon um, Baines Johnson library the next day in Houston. Um, and the RNC, I think, was cooking off in, in just a day or so. So you think of all of the drain of resources that those two events had, 
plus uh, Trump is kind of barnstorming Pennsylvania. So there's a finite level of resources. Now, I, I've been pretty critical of every director since 9-11. I, I, I think directors since 9-11 have really missed an opportunity to ask for more money, especially when the government was devoting a lot of money post 9-11 to sort of the wars overseas and the counterterrorism roles here in the country, which were both very important. However, you know, I, I think some of the directors really should have asked for significantly larger budgets, which would have helped solve this problem that we're not so reliant on local police to help accomplish the uh, protective mission. You know, um, something about the Secret Service, I don't have to tell you, Bill, but I, I think a lot of people are um, coming to terms with and familiarizing themselves with uh, how small uh, this agency is within the federal government. It's under the aegis of the Department of Homeland Security. That wasn't always the case. Uh, it used to be under the jurisdiction of the Department of the Treasury because Secret Service agents investigate financial crimes. Congressman Richie Torres, the Democrat of New York, has proposed a piece of legislation to take that responsibility away and put it back into uh, members of the Department of Treasury. Uh, so we talk about, you know, were they stretched too thin? I think that's an interesting and fair question to ask. In front of me, and Hal and I have discussed this, there are so many competing investigations going on at the moment. Uh, the Inspector General at the DHS, uh, some of these congressional investigations. Um, Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson uh, kind of mounted their own unilateral findings. Uh, Ron Johnson released a report not too long ago. Uh, it was released and made public by Speaker Mike Johnson. I'm going to read some of those findings and get you to respond to them as well. That Secret Service did not attend a security briefing provided to local special weapons and tactics SWAT and sniper teams uh, the morning of the shooting, July the 13th. Uh, that was one of the findings from Senator Johnson. Also that local law enforcement said communications were siloed and that they were not in frequent radio contact directly with the Secret Service, something we've just discussed. Uh, number three, that local law enforcement notified command about crooks prior to the shooting and received confirmation that Secret Service was aware of the notification, something we discussed. Uh, also, that following the shooting, Secret Service was seen on the roof of the AGR building with local law enforcement. Uh, we showed that video here. That was obtained uh, by Senator Chuck Grassley there, who put that out on his social media. And according to local law enforcement, Secret Service was initially not going to send snipers to the rally as well. So those were some of the findings coming in from Ron Johnson's preliminary report here. You know, you talk, Bill, about the run-up to some of these major events, some of these major rallies. Um, you know, we know it's not just political rallies. It's concerts, it's sporting events. The security's tight. The Secret Service doesn't have anything to do with those. They do, though, with their protectees. Uh, did they have enough latitude and runway before the Butler PA rally to prepare themselves for something like this, Bill? Uh, you know, Andrew, are you asking, did they have enough uh, time to prepare for, for the event? Did they have enough notice from the staff? Because, you know, my, my understanding from some of the timelines out there that there was about a week to prepare, which is fairly typical for a okay. domestic advance, for, for a foreign advance, um, you would typically get two weeks. So, and, and just being frank here and being honest, um, you know, that was a pretty simple rally. That was a ground ball. That was something the Secret Service does every single day okay. as far as the protective model. So as, as far as the, the lead up, you know, a lot of this stuff is staff driven. The Secret Service does not play any role in the selection of these lo locations. The staff picks them. And then the Secret Service has to adjust the protective model the best they can I see. to accomplish the protective mission given the, the location. So... Uh, from what I've read, sort of open source, it, it appears they had about a week to do the planning, which is pretty yeah, standard for pretty a domestic standard. advance. Okay. You know, um, before we get going here, um, there's still so many questions that remain. We've been talking about a lot of them here. Uh, the Secret Service now has an acting director in one Ronald Rowe. Um, Hal, and I'm going to pose the same question to you, Bill. Um, is the service going through a crisis of confidence? Of course, we have the DNC coming up. Uh, next Monday for four days. Uh, we heard from some Secret Service officials today. We'll get to that in just a moment here. How does the agency recover from something like this? Well, Andrew, obviously, uh, when you have something like this happen, it's a it's a huge hit on morale within the organization, and it's it's a cause for introspection. You know, they're going to be looking at their tactics, techniques, procedures across the board. Uh, they're going to be looking at their threat assessment process much more closely. 
one of the things they're going to be looking at probably a lot more closely is uh, how do they work with other agencies, law enforcement, other public safety agencies? You know, the model they've had has worked fairly well, pretty well for a lot. In fact, uh, one of the great things about the Secret Service was with National Security Special Events uh, shortly after 9-11, that was moved as a lead for Secret Service away from the FBI. I At the time, I thought that was a very smart move because the Secret Service does security all the time. That is their, that is their you know, for competency, if you will, as opposed to the FBI, which does investigations more than anything else. So they, they do a lot of things very, very right. But with that said, there will inevitably be changes. One of the things they're gonna have to do is look at other technology. I think drones is gonna become a, a ubiquitous part of every uh, protect the event going into the future. I, I can see a lot of that technology being used uh, and that'll also help them fill in the gaps, if you will, with some of the observation, obviously, uh, you know, where the sniper was, the AGR building, that was a gap in terms of observation. And, and a simple low cost drone could have made a lot of difference in that situation. Um, Bill, just lastly, I'm gonna pose the same question to you. Do you have confidence uh, in acting director Rowe uh, to you know, carry out some of these internal investigations uh, and restore confidence in the Secret Service, uh, we know in that briefing from August the 2nd, uh, he laid the blame squarely on the service. He said local and state law enforcement are, are not to blame here. Yeah, I don't know Director Rowe personally. I, I did work with him on a number of occasions okay. during uh, my, my time. So, I, you know, I, I, I did work with him. I found sure. him to be uber professional. Um, you know, I, I think that it's really the service is going to have to undergo sort of a transformational change here um, and really the uh, technology piece is going to have to be brought in um, and they're really going to have to ask for significant funding okay. because um, they, they clearly you know there's been report after report it's one of the worst places to work in DC for the government um, there, there's been these employee satisfaction surveys they always uh, finish up the last um, and, and part of that is just the, the, the demands, right? One of the things I was very proud of uh, when Roe gave his initial testimony um, when he was shortly named uh, the acting director was he talked about the toll that this takes on your personal life. Um, I, I can speak to that, just, you know, never being home, you know, being gone, you know, 150, 200 days a year. Uh, at, at the time, I had like a five-year-old son. Uh, he was like five or six, and I, I barely knew him because I was just gone all of the time because they, they just don't have the resources to keep up with the protective demand. And just lastly, I wanted to bring up too, before we go uh, briefly to uh, Hal and Bill, one thing uh, that you want an answer for in all of these investigations going forward. Hal, you first. Uh, the, the encrypted communications, I wanna know who Brooks was talking to, okay. what he was saying. That's what I want to know. Bill? Uh, I want to know what instructions were given to that team at the AGR building, the local law enforcement team, specifically what were they told and what was their area of responsibility? All right, uh, Bill Gage, Hal Kempfer, I can't thank you enough. Well, we wanted to devote a large chunk of this hour on this one month anniversary uh, of the Trump attempted assassination, uh, and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Thank, you, Thank you. All right. In the meantime here, we do want to um, put up some of these tweets from lawmakers also uh, marking this occasion today. Uh, we can't thank uh, Hal and Bill enough. We went a little bit long with them, but it's a story that requires it. Uh, I want to put some of these tweets up, like I said, though. Uh, there, Marsha Blackburn saying it's been one month since the assassination attempt on President Trump. And we still have little answers from Secret Service. She says the American people deserve transparency there in that video uh, posted on her uh, not official account there, her personal account. Marjorie Taylor Greene there saying one month ago today, Trump survived an assassination attempt. No one has been fired and we still don't know how and why it happened. And now it's no longer even a news story. She says, just think about how bad that really is. Also, Jim Banks, the congressman from Indiana, says today marks a month since an assassination attempt on President Trump's life. Big tech in the media wants you to move on and forget about it. We won't. There must be accountability. Also, uh, Representative Mary Miller there saying one month ago, President Trump was shot in an attempted assassination that took the life of Corey Comparatore and injured two others 30 days. And we still have 
No answers on the attacker's motives, who taught him how to make remote-controlled explosive devices, or the unguarded roof there. Uh, so Andy Biggs, of course, of Arizona says it's been one month since the Secret Service failures that resulted in the tragic death of Cory Comparatore and the near assassination of President Trump. It's unacceptable that we still have no answers as to why the rooftop was not secured there. Uh, also, Congressman Eric Burleson says, while some of the media have moved on, we certainly haven't. That's why I joined Eli Crane's resolution. So it seems like a lot of the same language coming out from uh, many members, Republican members of the House, including like Brian Mass there, saying it's been a month since the assassination attempt on President Donald Trump, and we have more questions than answers here. So wanted to get in some of the reaction there from lawmakers on Capitol Hill, all of those Republicans.